And just to let you guys know, we're going to record this. So we'll get started here. Well, okay. Well, thank everybody for joining us today as we shed a light on a skyrocketing crisis in our homes and our schools. It's affecting our loved ones, our children, and it's happening right now across Nevada. We're talking about vaping. And today, the Nevada Tobacco Prevention Coalition, known as the NTPC, with the support of the Southern Nevada Health District, the Washoe County Health District, the Attorney General's Office, and Senator Julia Ratty, we are public publicly recognizing this crisis. Our goal is to expand the awareness of the problem and educate kids and adults alike on vaping's harmful effects and risks. Now, as I said, please feel free to ask any questions. You can click the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen at any time, and then we'll get to those questions. Uh, we'll also have plenty of time at the end of the panelist discussion to open up for questions as well. Um, to start our program and to provide more insights as to why we as Nevadans should care about vaping, we have the NTPC president, Kelly Goatley Seals. Kelly is a native Nevadan, She's worked in public health for 18 years and is currently at the Washoe County Health District in the chronic disease prevention area, focused on tobacco prevention and control. So welcome, Goatley Seals. I'll turn my screen over to you. Great, thank you, Steve. I appreciate the introduction. Good afternoon. The Nevada Tobacco Prevention Coalition, or as Steve mentioned, NTPC, is made up of individuals who come together to work on tobacco prevention. The mission of this group is to improve the health of all Nevadans by reducing the burden of tobacco use and nicotine addiction. And when we say tobacco, we also mean vaping products with nicotine. I'm going to share some of NTPC's history because it relates to what we're talking about today. NTPC started in response to high youth smoking rates in the 90s. And in the early 90s, 30.5% or about one in every three youth were smoking cigarettes. Today, the rate of teen smoking has dropped to 3.6% here in Nevada with the help of groups like NTPC working on strategies that have been proven to decrease the use of tobacco. We're thrilled to see this level of reduction in the youth smoking rate, but recently we've seen use of nicotine vaping products reach rates comparable to those rates of smoking back in the 90s. NTPC and coalition members are concerned about Nevada consuming nicotine. When we talk about smoking traditional cigarettes or the, the kind that you need to light up, we hear about the dangers of lung cancer, cardiovascular risks, and stroke. We talk about vaping among youth when we talk about vaping among youth, we talk more about the potential impacts to the brain and vaping laying a foundation for potential addiction and future risk. So I'm gonna share a few more specific reasons that NTPC is concerned with youth vaping. So the first is that impact on the young brain. Until about age 25, the brain is still growing. And this puts young people uniquely at risk for long-term effects of exposing their developing brains to nicotine. As humans, each time we have new experiences or create new memories or a new skill is learned, we form stronger connections between our brain cells. Addiction has been described as a form of learning and when youth use nicotine, including that found in vaping devices, young people can get addicted more easily than adults. Other risks of nicotine on the young brain include mood swings, mood disorders, lowered impulse control, and less ability to pay attention and learn. Vaping can increase the chances that teens will smoke cigarettes and develop other addictions. Data is showing that teens who vape are more likely to smoke cigarettes, and we have 50 plus years of information showing us the health risks of, of smoking those combustible cigarettes. Additionally, data is also indicating that nicotine and e-cigarettes and other tobacco products can prime the adolescent brain for addiction to other drugs like cocaine. And the final concern that I'll share is the potential harms of e-cigarette aerosol. The aerosol from vaping can contain harmful and potentially harmful chemicals, as well as ultrafine particles that can be inhaled deep into the lungs. And scientists are still working to understand fully the health effects and harms of e-cigarette liquid and flavorings when it's heated, turned into an aerosol, and then inhaled. 
Um, and they're looking at risks for both active users as well as those that are exposed to secondhand aerosol. And to wrap up, I'd like to share a little bit about what is being done by the Nevada Tobacco Prevention Coalition about vaping. Um, the coalition has worked to advocate and educate about e-cigarettes, including educating our lawmakers. These lawmakers did several things in the 2019 legislative session. They included e-cigarettes in the Nevada law that prohibits smoking in most indoor public places. So anywhere where smoking cigarettes is prohibited, vaping is also now prohibited. Lawmakers also taxed e-cigarettes. And we know in the prevention world that youth are sensitive to price. And by making something more costly, youth are less likely to use it. So not only did this, not only did legislators tax the products, but recognizing the risks to Nevada youth, they took some of the money earned from those taxes to be used to address the problem of youth vaping in our state. And that's being done through June of this year. And NTPC and partners involved in NTPC have been using this funding, funding to support prevention efforts throughout the state. NTPC has all launched a large statewide media campaign to educate youth and adults about the risk of youth vaping. NTPC will continue to advocate for and educate about how important it is to fund these important kind of tobacco prevention activities. And we've seen the impact of prevention activities on our smoking rates, and we can impact vaping rates with sustained funding. When, with the current funding ending later this year, there'll be fewer resources available to youth and parents about vaping and its risks. So we have lots of more information for you this afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Now I would like to pass things on to the next speaker. Dr. Jennifer Pearson is an assistant professor in health administration and policy in the School of Community Health Sciences at the University of Nevada, Reno. Her research focuses on how regulation of tobacco and cannabis products affects behavior and public health outcomes. Dr. Pearson has authored over 100 peer-reviewed scientific articles on tobacco and cannabis policy and co-authored the 2016 Surgeon General's Report on e-cigarette use in youth and young adults. Thank you, Kelly. I have some slides to share with everyone, so I'm going to share my screen. There we go, and turn on the slideshow. There we are. Um, yeah, so I am uh, Jennifer Pearson. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Community Health Sciences at the University of Nevada, Reno. And today I'm going to share our information on um, vaping among high school students primarily. I'm going to report <clears throat> YRBS data, so Youth Risk Behavior Survey data from 2019. And so I, I'm going to first start off with this concept of early initiation. We have a, 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 some teens in Nevada are really trying vaping quite early. So in 2019, 3.6% of Nevada middle school students, sorry about my dog, and 7.5% of high school students in Nevada had used an e-cigarette either before age 11 for middle school students <clears throat> or before age 13 for high school students. Now you might look at these numbers and say, oh, that's not a very large percentage. Why should we be concerned about this? But there is one thing to really keep in mind here is that the earlier a kid starts using a substance, the greater risk they are at for negative future consequences. So they are at greater risk of becoming addicted to that substance. They're at greater risk of having negative health, out health outcomes and at greater risk of having negative social outcomes such as problems in school. So yes, these are, these are small numbers, but these are the kids who are really on the worst potential path they can be on. Um, these are the kids that are at the greatest risk of having the most suffering due to vaping. So um, it's really, really think about this group as, as the, the, the most at risk, the kids that really need the most help. So yeah, a lot of kids start early and by the time they get to high school, 24.1% of them in Nevada had been a past month user, user of, of vaping, of vaping nicotine specifically. 
Um, this, this right here shows you both change over time. So uh, we've seen an increase from 2017 to 2019 from 15.5% to 24.1%. And then this also shows you uh, vaping in um, comparison to other substances. So the blue line is alcohol. The kind of dusty rose line is cigarettes. The kind of orangey yellow line is cannabis. And the purple line is non-medical prescription pain medication. That's what PPM is. And so you can see here that uh, in 2019, Vaping was just a very close second to alcohol as far as the most commonly used substance in the past month among high school students. And this is remarkable because, you know, alcohol has been around for quite some time, but vaping wasn't even on our radar from a public health perspective 10 years ago because it, you know, it wasn't a thing really. So it has gone from zero to second place among adolescents, both nationally and in, in Nevada. So that is certainly um, a reason for concern um, when it comes to adolescent vaping. Uh, so which students are at greatest risk of being past month users? Well, um, we see much more past month use among adolescents, high school students specifically in Nevada, in our rural and frontier counties, so 38.6% of high school students in our rural and frontier counties used in the past month versus 21.2% in our urban counties. We also see um, our LGB kids, lesbian, gay, and bisexual high, high school students are at greater risk than the kids who identify as heterosexual. Similarly, um, kids who are trans think that um, they are at greater risk of um, vaping nicotine than kids who identify as cisgender. And then we also see a really close relationship between depressive symptoms or kind of mental distress in general and um, substance use. And that goes the same for vaping nicotine. So 31.8% uh, of high school students with depressive symptoms were also past month users of, uh, of e-cigs compared to only 15.9%. So really it's about half as many kids um, without depressive symptoms reporting use of e-cigs in the past month. And then we also see that e-cigs and uh, both cigarette smoking and cannabis use are closely related. So um, cigarette smokers, 85.4% of them had also vaped in the past month. But those two things are very closely related. And that's probably because cigarettes and vaping have the same basic ingredient, which is nicotine. So you can, you know, e-cigs are not a drug. They're a mode of administration. So cigarettes are a mode of administration of nicotine and vaping is a mode of administration of nicotine. So really they're all, they're using the same substance just in different ways. And then cannabis also closely linked to past month vaping, not as closely as cigarette smoking. So 68% of past month cannabis users had also used uh, a vape a, a nicotine vape as compared to 6.9% of kids who had never used cannabis. All right, so we see who's most at risk. We also ask kids how difficult do they think it is to get substances because how difficult they think it is to get it is very closely correlated to whether or not they use it. They're right about how difficult it is to get a certain substance. So um, again, you can see that vaping is in red. And you can see that 34.5% uh, think it's very easy and 24.1% think it's fairly easy to get a vape. And you can also see that those, that's vaping is, is the most commonly considered easy substance to get. And when you add those two easy categories together, you get nearly 60% of Nevada high school students think that it's easy to some degree to get vapes. And you know, compare that to the substances that they think are difficult to get. So prescription pain medication, cannabis, cigarettes. Um, though I should say there's also a pretty good number of kids that think cannabis is, is very easy or fairly easy to get. So let's just look at like, you know, prescription pain medication. That is also the least commonly used substance. So again, 
the perception of how easy it is to get is closely related to how often kids use it. And right then, highlighting, very easy. And then finally, where do they get them, right? Because these should be not legal to purchase. These are people who are primarily under the age of 18. Um, so youth, youth are mostly borrowing these things. You can see that's from the blue section there, almost half of the uh, youth in high school in Nevada in 2019 said that they had borrowed those, those devices. Okay, but where, who are, where are the, the kids that are borrowing them? They're getting them from other kids who got them somewhere, right? So where are they getting them? Well, 12.1% are either buying them for themselves or they're buying them in, uh, online. So they're getting them in like a store or gas station at 7.4% or 4.7% got them on the internet. That, that is essentially people walking into the store and purchasing them with either uh, an ID that's not legal or they're not getting age checked in the first place. Or another 25%-ish are getting them from someone who is intentionally buying them for them. So um, roughly about a third, therefore, are either buying them themselves or requesting someone else to buy them for them. And in research, we call these, uh, when you request someone else to get them for you, it's called a social source. And, you know, high school includes 18 year olds, right? Up until very recently, the minimum age for, for e-cigarette purchase was 18. Now we have what's called a tobacco 21 or a T21 law that it's federal. The phase in is, is, is in progress in Nevada. And so hopefully once that is completely phased in, we will see that 18 year olds won't be able to purchase e-cigarettes anymore. And, uh, you know, 21 year olds are hopefully not in high school. Uh, 18 year olds absolutely are in high school, might know a 15 year old and be willing to provide an e-cigarette to a 15 year old. 21 year olds and 15 year olds really aren't hanging out, out that often. So we're hoping again that this, this law will cut off social sources and shrink the size of this pie so that fewer kids can get their hands on e-cigarettes. Uh, so just in conclusion, vaping is pretty common among Nevada high school students, just a close second to alcohol as far as substance use behaviors go. They think it's pretty easy to get and it's pretty easy to buy for themselves. And the risk groups are rural students, LG, lesbian, gay, bisexual, and trans students, students with depressive symptoms, and kids who are recent users of cigarettes and cannabis. And so with that, I am going to um, introduce you to Malcolm Allo. So uh, Malcolm is the Tobacco Control Program Coordinator at the Southern Nevada Health District. He has nearly 20 years of tobacco control and prevention experience, overseeing strategies for youth and priority populations, has been recognized by multiple state and national awards. Malcolm currently sits on multiple local and national boards, serving as a subject matter expert on various tobacco control issues. The success of the tobacco control program has contributed to dramatic, a dramatic decrease in youth smoking in Clark County. And with that, I will turn it over to Malcolm and I'll put my contact information in the chat so folks have it if they want. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Pearson, for that alarming snapshot of the issues we are facing with youth vaping here in Nevada. This goes to show you that before there was a pandemic, there was an epidemic which we need to address here. Preventing our kids from using electronic vaping products is our goal. And I'm here to talk about what parents and guardians can do to prevent our youth from using these products. And the first thing is to have these conversations with these kids before they start. This means having these conversations early. As Dr. Pearson pointed out in her presentation, the age of initiation for some of these teens are as early as 11 or 12 years old, which is just shocking. Remember, the fastest way to get a teen to do something is to tell them not to do it. So it is important to not be confrontational when having these conversations, but instead present facts, dispel myths, and educate them on the dangers, both short-term and long-term, by using these electronic vaping products. And remember, don't use scare tactics. Also, when we're having these conversations with our teens, Make sure the format's in a comfortable environment. Be open and listen to them. 
I will share resources at the end of my presentation for more tips on how to have this conversation. Now, how can you tell if your teen is already using electronic vaping products? What are, the, what are the signs and symptoms that we need to look for? Here are some signs that you can look at if your teen is using electronic vaping products. The first sign is increased thirst. Increased thirst is one of the first signs of nicotine addiction and nicotine withdrawal. The next sign would be a new or a sweet smell. Many vapor products come in a variety of different flavors, such as strawberry, cotton candy, mango, peppermint, etc., and many more. So sometimes the smell will stick to their clothing, in their rooms, or even in their cars. The next would be an increased nosebleeds. You, using vapor products dries out the mouth and nasal cavities, therefore resulting in increased nosebleeds and also resulted in excess coughing or throat clearing. And one of the hardest signs to spot in our teens that are using electronic vaping products is their change in behavior or their mood swings. But we understand that this is a challenge as well. But there is good news. If you or your child needs help quitting tobacco or vaping, there is free help available. And I will also go over these resources at the end of my presentation. Now the next challenge is to identify these types of electronic vaping products. These products do not look like traditional combustible cigarettes that we're all used to, and they for sure do not smell like them. And in fact, many of these products look like regular items that regular teens use every single day. And I'm going to be honest with you, a lot of them smell, don't smell that bad either. We here at the Southern Nevada Health District have built partnerships with many of the Clark County High Schools here in our valley. Part of these partnerships is that these schools turn over any confiscated vapor items that they find on their campus or on their students. And to put this into perspective, when these high schools are turning over these confiscated project, products, these result in hundreds, if not thousands of items each semester. I'm now gonna show you some of these items that we recovered at these high schools on how teens hide or disguise their electronic vaping products. Here is an example of a highlighter um, that looks normal on surface, but you can tell at the bottom, um, it's a use for an electronic vaping product. So teens can use this to use um, nicotine, vapor, or even cannabis. Another example would be a normal Sharpie. So you could find this in one of your teen's bedrooms. It's actually a working Sharpie, so it actually really works. But if you twist the cap a little further, you'll see that the product inside is a Juul. And Juul looks like a USB drive like this. Juul is the most common type of electronic vaping product used amongst high schoolers. 50% plus of teens use this type of product. Um, so you can see how this product is easily um, disguised in, in everyday products like a Sharpie. Another example that was found at a high school is a brush. Normal brush, you would never think that it would be an electronic vaping product concealed device. But if you twist the bottom, you'll notice here another jewel pen for the teens to use um, and hide from the parents, guardians, teachers, or administrators. But it doesn't stop there, gang. Here we go. Gum. Um, here's a Trident gum. Normal case of gum in your, your student's backpack or their bedrooms. But if you reveal and you open up the gum pack, You'll see here that there's a holder for another jewel pen and some jewel pods. And again, these products are real life products that were confiscated at high schools here in Clark County um, and are used to, dis to hide the, the use of electronic vaping products um, in everyday view. Kleenex, you could see this in someone's car or in someone's bedroom, um, but if you just open it up a little bit, you'll see that teenagers hide their jewel pods in here. And it's also important to note that one jewel pod has as much nicotine as one pack of cigarettes. So this little container is very, very dangerous. A couple of more here. Here's a power bank um, to charge your cell phone. The alarming thing is that this is actually a functioning power bank, so it actually really works and it charges your phone. But if you pull it out, oh, well, you do. You can see that there's a, a jewel pen um, inside of the power bank. So you might see your student or your parent, I mean, or your, your kids charging their phones, not knowing that there's jewels hiding in it. A couple of more. Here's an iWatch, like an iPad watch. Um, you just click this button on the side and you'll see that this component will hold e-juice so that students will be able to use this e-juice component from their watch. Um, this is super alarming because this could be used during classrooms, etc. And two other things I wanted to show. Here's a normal backpack. Um, kids use backpack, fully functioning with sizes, um, with different compartments. But you can see here on the strap, if a student is using this backpack in school, there is a zipper here where they could open up. 
they'll hold their electronic vaping product in here and there will just be a little string here, like a little tab where students could be walking around campus and puffing the jewel and no one would even know because it's hidden in their backpacks that they use to school. And my final example I wanna show with you today is gear. A lot of different types of gear are now outfitted to hold electronic vaping products. And if you go on YouTube and you just Google how to turn your gear into electronic vaping product holders, um, you'll see how to make these. But here is just a regular sweater that any team you could see would use this. Um, but the little strings over here, the drawstring cords are actually vape holders. So you just puff and your vape is being held inside of your sweater like this. So you just puff from the drawstrings um, and no one would ever have an idea that you're using the electronic vaping product. So it's pretty alarming. Now I'm gonna share my slides so that I can give you some resources on what you can do. Let's talk vaping.com is a website developed by the Nevada Tobacco Prevention Coalition as a result of that, that money or that funding that Kelly spoke at at the beginning of the presentation that was funded by state lawmakers to address youth vaping. And this website is important because they give parents and guardians and teachers and administrators vaping facts and resources on how to talk to teens about the vaping conversation. The next resource I wanted to, to provide is My Life, My Quit. This website is for any teen who are current users of vaping products um, to give them cessation resources to quit. So teens can start or enroll in this program if they're a current vape user by texting start my quit to 36072 or they can call 1-800-QUIT-NOW from a Nevada area code um, to enroll. And last but not least, if you are a parent, guardian, or an adult that are current tobacco users or vape users, you yourself should be encouraged to quit smoking um, or vaping. So there's an adult helpline or help, uh, adult tobacco quit line for you, and that's 1-800-QUIT-NOW. Call, again, call from a Nevada area code, and this service is free and confidential, and you can visit this website at nevada.quitlogic.org. Um, and that concludes my presentation. Next up, I want to introduce Hillary Bunker the Supervising Senior Deputy Attorney General in the Tobacco Enforcement Unit at the Attorney General's Office, the unit that is responsible for overseeing tobacco youth compliance program, working with the Department of Taxation on tobacco related matters and enforcing the Master Settlement Agreement. Hillary received her undergraduate degree from UNR and her law degree from Chapman University School of Law. Prior to joining the Attorney General's Office, she worked for several years as an attorney for the Department of Veteran Affairs, handling appellate level review of claims at the Board of Veterans Appeals. Please welcome Hillary Bunker. Thanks, Malcolm. I'm gonna go ahead and get my slideshow ready. All right, so today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about what the Attorney General's Office does in our Tobacco Enforcement Unit for retail sales. So as you're likely aware in Nevada, it's illegal to sell tobacco products to someone under the age of 18. And that includes cigarettes, vapor products, and any sort of other tobacco product or OTP that would be cigars or chew or snuff. And although it's not against state law to possess tobacco products, localities can pass ordinances to make possession illegal for those minors under 18. So our office conducts random inspections on retailers throughout the state, and we attempt to make purchases of all tobacco products, including vapor products. The penalties were recently amended in the 2019 session and took effect January 1st of 2020. So there are civil penalties for both clerks and the licensees, and I've noted what those are. The asterisk corresponds to if that second or third sale is made within 24 months for a clerk. And then on the licensee, again, that's within 24 months, the financial penalties start on that third sale. So Tobacco 21 or T21 that you may be familiar with started in 2015, states began passing the T21 legislation. And as of January 1st, 2016, Hawaii was the first state to enforce it. As of right now, there's 33 states that have a T21 law Washington DC and Guam, and then various localities, counties or cities if their states permit it. 
On December 20th, 2019, federal law was amended. So that actually changed the overall federal law from 18 to 21. That's the age that someone has to be before you can sell them tobacco products. So similar to Nevada's definition, the federal definition includes cigarettes and smokeless tobacco, hookah, cigars, pipe, and then all of the e-cigarettes and e-liquids. On the federal law, it's, apply, it's applicable to both military members and tribal sales. There's no exception. The consumers must be 21. And there is no grandfather status that was written in for 18, 19, or 20 year olds. So as I mentioned, that's a federal law. So states like Nevada that do not have a T21 law in effect yet have a three year transition period to enforce T21. And if it is not enforced within that time period, then federal block grant funding can be reduced by up to 10%. So T21 in Nevada was attempted twice last session, AB 470 introduced and included the T21 language with some other tobacco related measures. This bill did not make it out of committee. And then AB 544 was introduced very late in session, also included the T21 language and an exemption for military members. It was approved in the House and sent to the Senate, but the legislative session ended before there could be any further movement on it. So the Attorney General's Office is sponsoring a T21 bill in the 2021 session, it's AB 59. And among other things, this will raise, raise the age from 18 to 21 that someone has to be before you can sell them products. And again, this encompasses cigarettes, OTP, vapor, or alternative nicotine products. We know that there's going to be a fiscal bill attached to it. It's not estimated yet for the 2021 session, but looking back to the 2019 session, there is a loss of excise tax revenue from 18, 19, and 20 year olds not being able to purchase these products. It came in for the course of two years at about 13 million. So we expect a similar fiscal bill once the Department of Taxation is able to make that estimate. So I will go ahead now and introduce our next speaker, and that would be Senator Ratty. She's represented Senate District 13, which includes part of Reno and Sparks since 2016. And prior to her state service, she spent eight years as a Spark City Council member. In her professional life, she served in leadership of Girl Scouts at the local and national level. And she's also led her own firm that provided consulting, consulting services to nonprofit and governmental organizations. She currently works for the Washer County Health District with a focus on behavioral health. And in her spare time, Senator Addy enjoys camping in her vintage Airstream with her husband, James, and their rescue dog, Gus. So I will turn it over to Senator Reddy. Let's try that. Can y'all hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. Well, first of all, I wanted to express my gratitude to the Nevada Tobacco Prevention Coalition for organizing today's event and specifically to them and all of the public health advocates who worked with me last session to pass the comprehensive package on vaping prevention. I really appreciate the good partnership and the work that this group does to make sure that we're keeping Nevadans safe. I'm here today to present a proclamation, so I'll go ahead and dive in and read that proclamation to you. Whereas the state of Nevada has a fundamental responsibility to protect the health and well being of current and future generations, and whereas teen vaping is an epidemic among Nevada's youth and its prevalence has increased exponentially, which is leading to a multitude of problems for Nevada's families, and whereas vape chemicals like nicotine negatively affect the parts of the brain that control attention, memory, and learning, and can even lead to serious mood disorders. And whereas nicotine is known to affect brain development and prime the brain for future addiction problems, and whereas vaping can expose lungs to harmful chemicals like, here we go, ac acetylhyde, maybe, acrolein and formaldehyde that are known to cause irreversible damage, and whereas many teenagers in Nevada do not fully understand the risks of vaping and nicotine addiction that are jeopardizing their current and future health, and Nevada's youth deserve our best efforts to protect their health. And whereas parents and educators have significant collective power to help educate Nevada's teens about the real dangers inherent to vaping, and the Nevada Tobacco Prevention Coalition supports these efforts, now 
therefore be it proclaimed that the educational work being done is recognized during Youth Vaping Prevention Awareness Day in the state of Nevada, dated this 26th day of January, 2021. So I hope that's a token of the gratitude of the state for all of the work that we are doing together to try to make sure that we are preventing future health problems and keeping both young people and everybody across the state of Nevada healthy. Thanks so much for your time. And I appreciate you letting me slip in here uh, while we're on a little break from our finance committee hearings. Thanks so much. Well, thank you, Senator Reddy. That is an exciting way to end this, uh, this, this little event. I really appreciate you showing up here today. Um, and I wanna thank everybody else who joined, including our media guests. Uh, before we finish it up, I would love to open up the floor for any questions you might have for our panelists. Um, feel free to enter in the Q&A chat box below, uh, or I'll try to turn on your mic too, and if you wanna just speak your question, if that's okay. Uh, we had one question for Dr. Pearson. Um, Jennifer, can you tell me more about how teen vaping can lead to addiction to cigarettes? Sure, excuse me, I have a cliff bar in my throat. <clears> throat> so, um, so there's a lot of research on this topic and our best guess right now is that e-cig use looks like it increases the likelihood that a kid will try smoking in the future. So essentially it increases the likelihood that a kid will initiate. This is very much concerning because as Kelly said, we've made incredible progress decreasing the number of kids who are past month smokers. We're down all the way to 3.6% which is just mind blowing considering in the mid nineties when I was in high school, it was 25, 30%. So that's huge. And over 400,000 Americans die from tobacco smoking each year. People think that this is a solved problem, but it's absolutely not a solved problem. Unfortunately, smoking is concentrated among people of the lowest socioeconomic statuses. So often maybe you don't know someone if you're of a higher income group, who smokes, but you know, that's just because you're not hanging out with the groups of, of people who are at greatest risk of being uh, daily smokers. So what we're concerned about is this link between e-cig use, which is as we see, easy to get their hands on, it's also easy to hide, and it does have the same addictive chemical as cigarettes. We're concerned that e-cig use Looks like it increases initiation of cigarette smoking, at least for some kids. And we're concerned that if that happens, we might see an increase in the proportion of kids who become more consistent cigarette smokers, because that is where there is huge harm, huge harm. N number one most harmful health behavior is cigarette smoking. It's the number one cause of preventable death. So, you know, e-cig use is harmful on its own for adolescents, but it's also concerning in that it might increase cigarette smoking. And um, I am happy to share my slides. Um, I don't know how we'd wanna do that, but um, I'm, I'm perfectly happy to share my slides. So I hope that answered your question. Thank you, Dr. Pearson. Uh, I have another question. Um, and this one goes to Kelly. Uh, you said that money being used since June 2020 to address problems of vaping in Nevada. Uh, what results or progress have we achieved so far? And what are the ongoing challenges and how do you think funds need to be allocated to deal with them? Sure, thank you for the question. And funds were dedicated, I believe the funds were allocated and got out to the state, if I'm remembering right, in about May, 
March of, of 20, Malcolm, help me out here. Anyway, we've, we've had them for about a year and a half and by the time they, they will end in June. And one of the things we saw during the presentation, Malcolm showed that slide, the Let's Talk Vaping, that is um, a campaign to educate parents. So that's one thing that's been done with the, the funding. Another piece is another campaign specific to youth. Um, within the communities throughout Nevada, Southern Nevada Health District, Washoe County Health District, a lot of our rural coalitions have received funding and we are implementing uh, activities within our own communities, whether it's with the school districts, whether it's with other youth organizations to, to let people know the impacts of, of this, let people know about those cessation um, services that are available for teens, um, how how people can quit vaping. And so all of this activity is, is happening, it's continuing. Um, like I mentioned earlier, we know how we can address tobacco use and vaping. And so with continued focus on those pieces, um, as mentioned, increasing the price, reducing the places where people are allowed to smoke and vape, um, enforcing the, the laws that are currently there, all those devices that Malcolm showed where kids are sneaking these. You know, when we're able to enforce the rules that say you can't use these products at school, it goes a long way in creating an environment where it's not supported. So we, we know what works. Um, and, and unfortunately, it does take funding to make all those things happen, to put some boots on the ground and, and get that education and information out, um, advocate for those policies. So um, that's, that's what we've done with funding. That's what we would continue to do with funding. And it really makes a big difference. Fantastic. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I have one more question for you from the chat here. Um, and you had talked a little bit about it, but uh, we will make the slides available. Uh, and we'll, uh, we'll reach out to you and you actually, you know what, write into Steve at NevadaCancerCoalition.org. And I will make sure those slides get out to you. Um, but there was a second question. Um, are there any peer to peer peer to peer prevention or quitting efforts going on in Nevada right now? Um, and I would bring that out to uh, Kelly or Malcolm probably. Um, Kelly, if you don't mind, I'll take this one. <laughs> um, absolutely. So like Dr. Kirsten said, our combustible cigarette rate for teens is down to 3.6%. And that was because of our youth strategies or our outreach efforts that we've done working with teens in different high schools and middle schools. And you are absolutely 100%. The most effective way to get teens to quit smoking or not prevent them from starting smoking or using electronic vaping products is peer-to-peer -peer strategies. So what we do here at the Southern Nevada Health District is we partner with 30 of the 32 different high schools here. And we identify, we go into these high schools and we identify who are the most influential teens in that high school. Are they the athletes? Are they the football players? Are they the cheerleaders, student council members? Whoever has the most influence, both on campus and both on social media, because we know that teens live on social media. We then identify those teens we extract them and we train them and we educate them about the dangers of vaping products. And then we use these teens to, dis to distribute our, our educational materials um, and help dispel the myths surrounding vape usage amongst their peers. Because we know that if I or any of my peers are on these high school campuses talking about how dangerous vaping is, they're just gonna not listen to us and go right over us old people. But if peers that you look up to or peers that are influential in your own social circle are telling you that these vape products are one, not healthy, or two, not cool, um, it would result in less people using the product. So absolutely, we use the same strategy that we've used to address combustible cigarette use and brought down that rate from 33% back in 2000 to 3.6% in 2019. We're gonna use that same strategy and hopefully we can get the same results um, with our current vaping use rates. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, I have one more question for you, Malcolm. Um, when you retrieve the hidden vaping tools, how do you do it? Um, are the schools following a specific process considering the sensitive nature of the issue? Do the peers retrieve them? 
does that happen? So, so this is super interesting. So we partnered with a lot of, like I said, 30 of the 32 high schools to collect their confiscated items at their high schools. And we give them um, freezer size Ziploc bags. And we tell them whenever that freezer Ziploc bag is filled with electronic vaping products to so give us a call and we'll send somebody out to the high school and then we, we take it and collect it and then we inventory it. The interesting thing that we've noted is that high schools that are in more prevalent, prevalent zip codes and then high schools who are in lower socioeconomic status zip codes, there is no difference. So the vape issue is across the board. Um, we collect the same number of bags at low income high schools that we do from high income high schools. So um, just as the bags get filled, Steve, we go around and we collect these items and then we bring it back to the health district and we, then we do an inventory and then we collect the fun items like these that I, that I showed that is kind of unique on how, they, how these teens hide the vape products from their administrators or teachers. And then of course, parents and guardians. Fantastic, thank you, Malcolm. Is there any more questions I can help you with? I'm looking in the chats in the Q and A. Um, once again, thank you, Carrie. My email uh, is in the chat room. Uh, send me at steve at nevadacancercoalition.org and I'll make sure those slides get out to you. Um, I did want to do a shout out to thank you, Malcolm, at the Southern Nevada Health District for mentioning letstalkvaping.com, Kelly as well. Um, I also encourage you to visit behindthehazenv.com, and I'll put this in the chat room. And you'll get a glimpse of what our kids are seeing on their devices right now. And that's part of the campaign when Kelly's talking about funding going out as preventative and educational campaigns. Um, these are some of the messages that um, our kids are seeing on devices right now. You could also visit tobaccofreenv.org for more information um, and that is the website for the Nevada Tobacco Prevention Coalition. Um, are there any more questions I can help you with? Uh, panelists, if you have any other thoughts, let them, let them free. Uh, Otherwise, I really do appreciate everybody's participation in this event. Um, I hope this gets the word out and I hope uh, we, we've made a strong impact on you and, and, and we can help parents and kids alike. So with that, thank you very much. I'll put a close to this presentation. It will be on, uh, it will be recorded or it is recorded. So feel free to reach out to me if you need some of that information as well. Thank you panelists. And I want everybody to have a great Tuesday. Be safe. Thanks everyone.